We're uh, working our way through the I Will book. Did have a copy up here and it left. But the, that's all right. I don't need it. You can get the book from back there on the table. If you don't have a copy, we'd like you to get one if you don't have one. And uh, this week we're doing the message that all ministers dread, which is I will give generously. And, uh, you know, I hate talking about money, but I've learned over all the years that it's an important thing to talk about. And uh, it's better when you do talk about it because people end up getting blessed when you actually do the principles of Scripture. People get blessed. Amen. And, you know, we've had testimony after testimony about people. You know, last year it was Rich to, you know, talking about tithing, you know, and how it transformed his life, you know. And uh, he was kind of like, I wish I'd have done this a long time ago. And, uh, and Eddie, you know, talked about it before that. And, you know, through all the years, you know, so many dozens and dozens of people have stood up here, talked about tithing and how it changed their lives. And they wish they'd have done it sooner. And so, you know, we just encourage you today to receive the word and allow God to cause you to have a transformational moment in terms of, of giving. I think it's one of the most healing things that can happen in your life is, uh, is to give, especially when you need. Um, and, you know, when, when Debbie went to heaven, like, <clears throat> the thing that made me feel the best was to help people and to do something to bless them. And I was able to bless a few people around Christmas time and... Um, and, and, and the joy that gave me, it just made me feel so good to be able to do something to bless somebody. And there was more healing than that for me than anything else. So first scripture we're going to look at, Matthew 6, 24. And this is one of the scriptures that's in the book. No one can serve two masters or either will hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. And put a little asterisk by wealth and write in, there's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth. It's when you serve wealth that you get into trouble. Amen? Amen. It's when everything you do is about accumulating wealth and putting wealth or riches into your life so you think you are safe and you think that you uh, have made your life more invincible or more uh, fun or whatever it is that you think that you need to have and you're, and you're getting it by putting together wealth. Uh, Steve Jobs was super wealthy, okay, the guy that, you know, the main guy that developed Apple. But then he got cancer, and he died. The wealth didn't do anything. I mean, he used all that wealth trying to get healing, but it did not work. The wealth does not really accomplish what we want in this lifetime. And people, the interesting thing about people you know, somebody becomes a billionaire and, and, and we think, well, if I had a billion dollars, I wouldn't need another dollar, right? But when somebody gets to a billion, what do they do? Yeah. Try for two, right? You get two, then what happens? You just keep pressing. And then what we discover is that in accumulating a billion dollars, people go back and look at the trail uh, uh, that happened behind that and uh, there's, this doesn't happen to everybody, but many times there's children who didn't have a dad or a mom because that person was pursuing money or serving the job instead of, you know, loving their spouse and giving them time also or neglecting the kingdom of God to serve wealth. It's dangerous. A lot of people get involved in that. And so we want to have good motives and a right heart when we're 
you know, serving God and not allowing this love for money to come in and get into our souls. Second Corinthians says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. This is science. If you take a cup of corn and go out and plant it out in this fields and then come back in the fall with your big combine, what's going to be in your combine? Weeds. And a cup of corn that grew into whatever, how many ears that would be. Now, if you take truckloads of seed and plant it out in this field, you will have a harvest, amen? And so we have to figure out, you know, if you sow a little bit, you're going to get back a little bit. If you can sow a whole bunch, you're going to have a big harvest. And then it says, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so a lot of people look at this and go, wow, I don't have to give because I am grumpy. Okay. I want to keep my money. No, what happens there is you got to go get right with God, amen? So you can give with joy because what we're supposed to be doing is listening to the number that he gives us and then we're supposed to write that down and put that in. And people go, oh, I don't know if I can tithe. How can I give 10% of my gross? Well, I've done it, and, and, you know, as a family, we've done it ever since ground zero because that's what we were taught. We knew that's how you lived life, and so right off the top comes 10%, and you live on everything else. And I think, you know, one of the, you know, how there's things you wish you knew back when you were 18, and you could just start living that way, right? Could I go back? And one of the things that, that I always tithe, but one of the things that I've learned now is that really you should be living on about 50% of your income. And save it, get, first you give the 10%, then you pay your taxes, then you save 30% and live on what's left. And if you lived like that, you would, you know, get into your 50s, and you'd be able to retire, right? I mean, I don't think you should retire. I don't think anybody should ever retire. I think you should change what you're doing in life. You can work a job till you're 65, but you shouldn't retire from life, amen? amen. You, you, if, you should be doing whatever you're supposed to be doing. Here's a little n another nugget. I'm gonna share this because God just told me to. If you don't have a job, you know what your job is? Getting a job. And, and I've told this to a lot of people through the years. They come up to me, I can't find a job. I said, well, how many hours a week are you looking for a job? Oh, you know, like I went to two or three interviews this week. I'm like, you have to spend 40 hours a week looking for a job. And you know what happens when people do that? They get a job. Because they hate looking for a job, so they just get one because it's terrible. So if you don't have a job right now or you want a better job, put 40 hours a week into getting a job. You will find or, and or get a better job. But we got to be able to give with joy. Then verse 10, it says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest. This is an important um, principle of personal economy. We talked about it a few weeks ago when the, the, in the book of Acts, they, it says they had everything in common and they were dispersing the people as they had need. And I said, this is not communism. We know that because people were in control of what they gave or, or didn't give. They didn't have to turn everything in. And what they were doing was stuff would come in and be directed to people who were in need. They did not take everything and split it up equally among the crowd. Okay? Two different principles. 
if, if we as a group decided, hey, let's alleviate all the poorness that we possibly can. We're going to sell everything we own, collect it all together, and give it away tomorrow. What would happen on Tuesday? We'd be the poor. And we'd all be going, help me. Um, so the principle is, we should all be increasing our economies, our personal economy, so we can give more. If you're making 10000 a year, what's your tithe? $1,000. If you're making $100,000 a year, what's your tithe? $10,000. is not that cool? So I want you to make 100000 so you can give more, and that way we can bless more people and do more good things, right? So we need to be expanding our our economy. Down here, there's a note from the book that says the Greek word for cheerful is the same word from which we get hilarious. How many of you feel hilarious at the offering? <laughs> we should feel hilarious at the offering time. The word connotes overflowing, giving, overflowing, giving, joyous giving, even hilarious giving. And honestly, that's how I feel about that when I give. And there's been times where, you know, God blessed us in just a, a magnificent way. I think I could tell, I tell this story now to people all the time, and I don't know if I told it in the, in the crowd thing, but, uh, you know, Ann Teft and her brother Bill Radabaugh, who's in heaven now, uh, they gave us this barn and the land, and, uh, and she joined the church, and she went to the bank and got all the fundraising so we could remodel this building into a church, and that was all really exciting. But I was still painting full-time and doing church full-time, and I had my big family, which is, you know, more or less full-time. And <laughs> then I was in here in the church actually helping build it and remodel it with Gary Tope, and uh, she came by one day, and she goes, you should not be painting. I said, yeah, but my children like eating. And so that's, you know, we, we have to keep painting. And she says, she goes to me, she says, how much money can you make in six months of painting? And I was doing very well at painting. And so I told her this number and she pulled out her checkbook and wrote that number in and tore it out and handed it to me. And I was able to quit painting. And so God does miraculous things like that in your life. Now, if you were, you know, a pessimist, you would say, why didn't he give me that check seven years earlier? Why did I have to paint for seven years? But God used all that painting to get us right here in this place. That's how we got here. So God's past sometimes, we don't understand it, but it works out in the end. Luke 6.38, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So the illustration for this is, what kind of measure are you going to hand to God so he can pour blessings into your life? Are you going to give him a half cup measure? You're going to give him a two cup measure? Now remember, he's going to use that to dip into whatever it is and pour it into your lap, running over, pressed down, shaking together, running over. So, you know, are you give him a five-gallon bucket, 55-gallon drum. What are you going to hand God so it can pour into your life? You're giving God the measuring device. That's something to think about when you're giving. Proverbs 3, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So we're not supposed to give what we got left, right? We're supposed to give the best, the first off the top. Like I said, tithe first, pay your taxes, do everything else afterwards. Now, I know for a fact that many of us don't live on 50% of we, what we make. We live on 110%, right? Many of us are on our credit cards. 
I understand that. I've, I've been there. So, this is just my suggestion. This is not out of the Bible. I don't even know if this is the right thing to do. But I think it helps some people. Because you talk about tithing, you talk about giving 10%, that's the baseline. We should be shooting to give 15, 20, you know, you know how we're always given a dollar or two or something like that uh, for offerings. And that's been a huge blessing to people out there that we've been able to bless, you know, orphans and widows and the hurting and people in human trafficking and, and all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, missionaries that are taking the gospel into places where the good news would never be heard except we're helping them do it. We're doing all those things with those offerings. You know, when I said, you know, I spent weeks, months, where I was making sure I got something in the plate every single week, and then I suggested to everyone here, don't let the basket go by or whatever we pass. Don't let it go by without putting something in. And you know, we tripled our offerings just by doing that. So instead of giving... That year, I think, instead of giving away 10000 we gave away 30000 Isn't that cool? And it didn't hurt anybody, right? It didn't hurt any of us. And it, it's exciting to see, you know, how God blesses through that. And I've got a new suggestion. We, 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 tell the, we tell everybody, don't put change in the thing because the people who count the money, you know, cringe, you know. But I... But children need to be taught this principle about putting something in. And so I encourage you, give your children change to put into the offering thing. And for the money counting people, just take all the change and put it in a tub and we'll dump it into a thing and then we'll take it to the bank at the end of the year and let the machine count it. Okay? So I encourage you as parents, start giving your kids change and, and the principle of putting something in. Also, teach your kids how to tithe. I, t I taught Bear how to tithe. He made a pretty good chunk of money, like $400 from his rabbits for the, count the Delaware County Fair, 4-H. And it was a shock. We're taking how much? <laughs> I said 10%, so it was like 39 bucks. I said, we're gonna round it up to 40. Up, rounded up, you know. <laughs> I said, I said, yeah. <laughs> and then, but the the good thing, you know, this was after Debbie went to heaven, so she had a plan where she was going to take a big chunk because she had actually done most of the feeding and cleaning and taking care of buying all this stuff for the rabbits. And I I said, look, I'm not going to take that money from you. And he saw how much that was, which was much more than $40. And he saw the tithe. He said, okay, this is going to work. Okay. <laughs> uh, 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money, the love of money, money is not the root of all evil. What's the root of all evil? Love. The love of money. Don't love the money. Uh, Flip over in Hebrews 13. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Luke 16. Now, we read this last verse on the first page. You cannot serve God and wealth. But here, listen to this, the beginning of that little passage. Jesus is speaking. He says, I say to you, Make friends for yourself by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. Here's what I think that scripture means. I think that means that there are people out there that are not your friends and you're supposed to use money to make them your friends. Because that's what it says. Right? Read it again. I say to you, make friends for yourself by means of wealth. Right? So if you're going to make a friend by using money, they probably weren't your friend to start with. Because you're making a friend. So you go find somebody, you make friends with them by 
somehow investing into their life. Maybe you take them out to dinner. Maybe you fix something for them that they couldn't fix themselves. You invest in their lives. And then it says that they will receive you into eternal dwellings. I think that means when you get to heaven, somehow some of them have got to heaven because you did this. You did an act of kindness. You loved them. You touched their life. They found Jesus Christ through this whole process, and they end up where? In eternal dwellings. And so when you get there, you walk in, and you say, whoa, I didn't know you were going to be here. And they said, yeah, you remember? You spent 50 bucks on me and fixed my muffler, and that whole thing led me to come in the church, and I got saved, and look, here I am. Right? I think that's what that scripture means. And if you can think of another interpretation, I'm totally open to it. All right, we're going to do our, we're going to break into small groups here after we sing a song. So the band's going to come up. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, this is a touchy subject because money is really important to all of us. We, it makes us feel safe. It, uh, it provides for us to do things in life, accomplish things. Um, and we know that it's more important that our treasure is in you and not in anything in this world. And so we just want you to give us this great attitude, this great mindset that you are going to supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. And that you want us to increase our economy, that you want to, and that you are interested in supplying seed so we can have a greater harvest. And Father, we want to be hard workers and we want to be productive uh, providers. And we want to do all these things, but we want to do it with the right attitude. And we want you to be our master and not wealth. And we want to serve you and not wealth. And we want to do it with this hilarious joy And we ask that you would just cause that to come into our hearts and fill us up and just be who we are. Just hilarious, generous givers who are looking for opportunities to bless. Father, give us the faith to stretch out and give generously. And we pray this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.